this series has given us the opportunity to respond to a second pandemic that is plaguing our nation, racist policing and state sanctioned violence against black communities. In the first panel, we were fortunate to hear from County Commissioner Tammy Sawyer, Dr. Earl J. Fisher and Dr. Earl Wright, who helped put this moment into context. Last week, we heard from Rashawn Austin and Dr. Charles McKinney and Luther Ivory. And today, as I had mentioned, we're gonna focus on the future and we'll be hearing from three experts here at Rhodes College. Uh, each panelist will present for about 10 minutes and I'll ask some follow-up questions. After each panelist has presented, there'll be time for each of you um, to ask questions. So please, as you are learning from these experts, go ahead and type in your questions into the chat box. Um, so without further ado, let me jump right in to introducing our three panelists for the evening. I want to first introduce Dr. Arcandria Owens. She is a licensed psychologist and the Associate Director of the Student Counseling Center at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. Owens is a generalist by training, but has specific interest in the treatment of racial trauma, grief and loss, and spirituality and religious concerns. Dr. Owens works as a racial equity consultant, diversity trainer, and discusses discussant on issues pertaining to the experience of racial trauma in white spaces. She is also the founder of Healing Black Narratives, an initiative recently begun on Instagram, aimed at promoting wellness and healing in the Black community. Thank you for joining us. Next, I want to introduce Dr. Christy Lipford. She is a medical sociologist in the Health Equity and Urban Studies programs here at Rhodes College. Her research explores the sociocultural and environmental determinants of health disparities with a specific interest in how social inequalities, discrimination, and racism influence health services, self-management of chronic diseases, and health behaviors. Her most recent grant funded research focuses on maternity care and birth doulas as a cultural bridge between providers and expectant mothers. Hi, Dr. Lipford, thank you. Um, and lastly, I wanna introduce Dr. Loins. So Dr. Dwayne T. Loins Sr. is an assistant professor of urban studies and Africana studies at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. His research and teaching are situated at the sweet spot where race, philosophy, religion, culture, and justice intersect. Dr. Loins also teaches courses for the LIFE program at Rhodes and is a faculty member of the college's post-baccalaureate certificate in health equity. Um, so please welcome these three experts. I'm very lucky to have them um, as my colleagues here at Rhodes College. And I'm first gonna pass it off to Dr. Arcandre Owens to get us started. Thank you. Great, it's so wonderful to be here with all of you this evening. And um, if someone can let me know if they're seeing my screen, um, Dr. Mershon. Okay, I'm, I'm hoping my screen is on. <laughs> okay, got it in the chat, we are good. All right, so, um, Yes, I'm really excited to be here because um, I, I've appreciated how this series has kind of moved um, and that we're here at the third part where we get to actually talk about the future, um, which is something we, we ultimately have some power over. Um, and so I'm thankful to be able to be a part of the discussion and hope that we will be able to uh, engage it in, in healing ways. And so I'm going to come and talk about racial trauma uh, and the Black experience and specifically going to be looking at uh, Black families and, and Black communities as well. So um, first, uh, it's really important that we define racial trauma. Um, it's the physical and psychological symptoms that people of color often experience after being exposed to stressful experiences of racism. And so this is um, one of those definitions that's kind of a catch-all, but um, it's more uh, maybe definable by how we experience it. And so I want to share um, that it has great impact that um, although our uh, field of psychology hasn't really uh, been the first voice to talk about racial trauma, uh, that racial trauma has been uh, spoken to and truth spoken about it in uh, social media and other blogs and, and articles and things like that. And now the psychology world is starting to catch up. So thankful for that. So often racial trauma uh, looks a lot like post-traumatic stress disorder. But the thing that really differentiates it 
is that racial trauma um, is the experience of ongoing injury, ongoing wounding. That is not uh, a one-time event. And so racial trauma is something that is difficult to heal from because ultimately the, the next wounding is right around the corner. Um, and we're consistently waiting for that. And so uh, racial trauma is its own type of trauma and um, it's historical and cumulative, which means that it consists of trauma that was associated with genocide, with um, colonization, with enslavement, and also uh, just with um, relocation for indigenous people. So racial trauma embodies the historical trauma that we've experienced. It's also a cumulative experience. This is the recognition that racial trauma occurs um, not only from our individual experiences uh, of racism, but also the experiences of the people around us, what we see in the media, what we see in our families, um, and how uh, the collective of our communities of color experience racial trauma. And so trauma in and of itself uh, lives in the body. It's, it's this consistent experience of wounding. And what is important about this type of trauma is that we are carriers of the entire narrative. Um, and so historical trauma and also the current traumas that are, we are experiencing, especially when we take a look even over the last few months um, of this second pandemic that has unfolded in our lives as well. Um, nothing new to us in our community, but something that continues to be wounding. Um, the big part of this is that often what we don't realize is that our socialization process of pe as people of color, parents of color, um, grandparents of color, sharing with uh, the next generation ways to keep themselves safe, you know, to honor their blackness or honor their, um, the, um, their status as a person of color um, is also traumatizing. So the, the lessons that we learn to be able to cope with being in white America and dealing with white supremacy is also a traumatic experience. It's a traumatizing that we do in-house to be able to um, hopefully uh, live and, and live more, uh, live better uh, and more well. And so racial trauma also encompasses all those messages, all those stories, and it's also intergenerationally transmitted. And basically what that means is that even without the sharing of stories, even without the, the speaking about uh, traumatic experiences that um, have befallen us, um, we even nonverbal experiences of trauma are transmitted. And we'll kind of talk a little bit more about how that makes itself known. But racial trauma is definitely very comprehensive and, and that's where we want to foundationally land right now as we are talking about this. So this is just uh, you know, an example. I was listening uh, to Dr. Joy Leary as she was talking about post-traumatic slave uh, disorder. And um, she gave an example that I thought could be really helpful here of just how the transmission of trauma um, happens. And so kind of a real world example is, is a recipe um, and how a recipe is handed down multiple generations, right? So grandma or big mama has this amazing recipe um, for whatever it is, you know, that we love to eat. And what happens is we watch or we get this written down, well, if you're a part of a, a family of color, then probably you generally didn't get anything written. It's more so eyesight. <laughs> but we have this recipe that's being passed down um, and there's no questioning about like why, uh, you know, grandma put in that, uh, that ingredient or this other one, but it's just from the watching, it's just from the learning, uh, either uh, written or non-verbally about this recipe that it's passed down, it's transmitted. Um, and even if it's, if it's not a great recipe and, and we could change it, you know, sometimes we don't because it's just the thing that's been passed down. And so recipes work in this way. We have kind of this narrative around um, what, uh, what, how this product is made and it just gets transmitted and we don't question it. So I want, before I switch to this next uh, slide, just to kind of offer that it is going to show um, some images that might be triggering. So please um, know that and take care of yourself as you need to. And I'll switch this. So when we talk about um, recipes, um, we also have to talk about 
the recipe that has um, created our um, history. And this recognition um, that we also have a history, we also have this recipe um, for how we see the world, how, um, how we experience the world uh, that has been really founded in a foundation of white supremacy. And so as we look at these images, we recognize that our trauma that we have been experiencing has been happening for hundreds of years. And that um, within that traumatic experience, um, that these stories, each of these pictures, even if we weren't alive for them, live inside of our body, live inside of our psyche, um, live inside of our narratives. Um, so much so that you know our mental and our emotional health are impacted by it, our spiritual health, um, even the, the way that our nervous system works is impacted by all of these events that um, have uh, you know, colored our world. Um, in various ways. And so we see that some of these, you know, are pictures from 400 years ago, and some of these are pictures from weeks ago. Uh, and so I want to put this out there as, as kind of like that recipe, right, that has been transmitted down the line and recognizing that just like a recipe can be transmitted and the learning that comes from that can be transmitted, so does obviously um, how um, our narratives have you know, have been engaged, how our narratives have been created. And so all of these pictures, all of the millions and millions of narratives that we could spend time talking about um, have transmitted this trauma intergenerationally um, and has caused all of us to kind of live on the spectrum of experiencing that trauma. So the impact of inter intergenerational trauma, kind of that last piece of racial trauma that I was talking about, um, has many impacts, and these are just a few, but it's really interesting um, that, and, and this is very rampant in the, in the trauma literature, uh, but it also appears in when we're talking about race, racial trauma, is that our DNA is changed by it. So um, trauma that lives in our body and that's passed down uh, actually affects the expression of our DNA. Um, and not necessarily just the, the actual um, components of the DNA, but how they are expressed. Um, it also impacts us spiritually. It often impacts how we see ourselves um, in relationship to our higher power or to God or to Buddha, Allah, whoever. Um, and it also impacts us relationally um, and, um, and also communally. And those are big ones that I think we're, we're seeing a lot of, is just recognizing that how we see ourselves individually and how we then see the worth and the value of the person in front of us who looks like us, how we engage in our families or disengage from our families, um, what it means to be potentially in a two-parent home versus a single-parent home or a multi-generational home, um, all in just the collective of our community, all of these are impacted by uh, the traumas that we've experienced, um, which is really important to think about and sometimes very overwhelming. Um, but also what's important here is to also think about how can we heal. And so this is not an exhaustive list. You know, we were given about 10 or 15 minutes, so I'm going to stick to that as close as possible. But here's kind of a, you know, just an overview of ways that we can actively engage and intervene in our own trauma. Because the recognition is, is that we are not necessarily going to change the world tomorrow, that racism is still going to exist, um, even as we are doing the work daily um, to, to heal our country of white supremacy, to heal our systems and our institutions of white supremacy, and to heal ourselves, of course, of white supremacy. So here are some of the ways that we can do that, um, especially as we're looking towards the future. Remember, our power that we have to change and to create um, is only in the now and in the future. And so these are ways that we can actively intervene right now. And that's through um, expression movements and just individual family and collective healing. And so with expression, um, it's really important to know that trauma, as I said, lives in our bodies. And until it's uh, expressed uh, non-verbally and verbally, it just stays there. Our aches and our pains sometimes are not about old age and sometimes not about um, you know, that, that injury that we had way back when. Sometimes you know, our aches and our pains are very much uh, the experiences of trauma in our body. So expression, 
active narration, active sharing of your stories um, in our own voice, uh, in our own tones. Sometimes there's a lot of people who try to police our tones and police how we share our stories and how we speak. Um, and so part of our healing is to do that um, anyway, regardless of the policing, um, and to do that, uh, especially with trusted others. Um, expressive arts of any kind, singing, poetry, spoken word, musical instruments, arts, are really important, again, because it takes um, some of what you're experiencing inside of you and puts it on a medium uh, where it does not have to live in your body anymore. Uh, and it's being expressed. Therapy, obviously, um, as a therapist, I, I feel very, uh, um, you know, I recommend, I recommend this highly, uh, but racial trauma treatment and recovery is really important. So finding a therapist, finding a fit where you can talk and um, express yourself more fully uh, is really important to healing. And also activism. And I talk about this um, not just as the activism that we've been seeing, the protests out on the streets where people have made signs and they're wearing the shirts and they are really challenging um, our society, which I love, but also it's the everyday activism that happens. So every time your black body moves into a white space is an act of protest and an act of activism. Every time that Maybe you, you stay silent when you don't want to speak or you speak when maybe it's not as safe to you um, around boardrooms and meeting rooms. That is an act of everyday activism. Refusing to be tokenized in, in specific places is an is a, um, everyday activism. Resting well, breathing deeply, loving deeply are also everyday acts of activism and protest. Also movement is really important. Dance, walking, running, hiking, Posturing, um, so posturing yourself for success. Um, I don't know if people have heard of power postures and things like that, but those are really helpful. Again, it moves your body into a space that feels powerful, that feels um, like it can generate change. Um, and those are the places where we can maybe do some of the work of healing too. And lastly, um, individual family and collective healing. It's really important that we learn our true history uh, not the whitewashed history that we are often fed in schools. Um, we have, uh, you know, without, our, our education system was not built for people of color. Um, we weren't allowed, we weren't um, even allowed to read. And so we have to recognize that also what's being taught in the books is not congruent completely with who we are or our experiences. And so it's important to learn our, our true history. Um, and to also recognize that this impacts families, this impacts our community. So the more that we lean into truth and the more that we know our, um, our narrative, the better. We need to recognize the socialization process as the traumatic experience it is, as I talked about early, earlier. And we need to make sure, um, excuse, oops, sorry about that. We need to um, make sure uh, that the process also is about affirmation, health, and wellness. So we want to move from a narrative that's solely about oppression to a narrative of resiliency and of royalty, the truth of who our people are. Um, and we want to move into hearing from other voices of color in media, television shows, um, your, your favorite movies, um, your favorite voices in different places. Um, because this moves us from feeling isolated in our experiences. We want to build upon and own the strengths um, that we have. We want to not be small because we were meant for a lot more than that. Um, and we want to do the work of unlearning white supremacy. And that's not just about unlearning for ourselves, our own internalized white supremacy, because we've been in that culture for a very long time. So of course we're being impacted by it but we also want to challenge and invite and um, uh, you know, support, but not be the support for white people to do the exact same thing, to unlearn their white supremacy, to be able to name it when it happens and to encourage them to move um, so that our healing you know, for both, for all of us, um, is helping us move as a collective uh, towards wealth, or sorry, wellness and health. Um, versus con keeping us constrained. And so um, I hope this was helpful um, and thank you so much.
Thank you, Dr. Owens. Before you head off, can I ask a follow-up question? So thank you so much for you know, making those parallels to schools and even the discussion of the importance of um, arts, um, arts in schools. Um, I'm really intrigued about sort of this family healing and sort of, you know, you mentioned how it's re-traumatizing though to, to tell the story over and over again. So how do we have sort of the elders share their stories without having to undergo this, you know, re-traumatization, especially for groups of folks who probably aren't as um, pro-therapy, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, which is fine. Let me go ahead and say that to you. Um, yeah, you know, I think that's a, that's a hard one because sometimes, you know, the, as I said, the socialization is meant to protect, right? It's meant to share the stories, the needed stories, uh, to make sure that we don't, um, you know, get harmed by police or by other white people or institutions. I think the part that's really important is also how do our ancestors and our elders um, also transmit stories, you know, of their own resilience mm -hmm. and the ways that they moved through um, the successes and achievements that they had as well. Um, because sometimes those don't get as prioritized because they're not the ones that are seen as being like, the things that are going to keep people safe. Um, and sometimes that's the big, you know, the big part of the conversation is how do we promote that? Um, I think what we have to do, uh, and, and I'm learning this too, as I'm raising two little girls, is that I also have to share like the, the ways that, um, that our community, um, our, our history shows that we are resilient as well, um, that we are miracles in the making every single day because we weren't meant to survive what we have survived. Um, and also to really um, highlight when, when we are educated to another degree, like whenever you know, each generation is getting better, like recognizing um, that that wasn't coincidence, but speaking to how did that happen so that we can continue to move and grow as well. Um, I think this is really apparent just in my own family. You know, my, my grandmother has a third grade, um, third grade education. Smartest woman I know though, um, let me go ahead and say that. Um, but she cannot um, speak about the things that she's experienced in her life. Um, and, I, and I can only assume, you know, as a woman who has cleaned the houses of white people her entire life, um, who had her first job, um, you know, past picking, picking cotton um, when she was seven years old, when her mother died. You know, mm -hmm. I can only imagine the trauma that lives in her body. And so sometimes, you know, it's hard for, for stories to be told. Um, and so I think uh, part of the healing and, and part of the family transmission um, is one, not, you know, not rushing uh, narratives that People can't tell, <laughs> you know, right now, but also if there's ways to continually send the message of, of how we've overcome, right, how we've moved um, and, and how we've done that through various systems that were white and not meant for us, I think those are also important conversations to have. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. So I want to thank you for giving us the, the mental health perspective. And I want to turn it over to Dr. Christy Lipford, who will be talking about um, this from a sociological perspective and its effects on the Black body. So thank you, uh, Dr. Lipford. Great. Can you guys see that? Hello. Great. I can All see right. You. Well, first off, I want to start off by giving thanks. I'm really grateful for the opportunity opportunity to share my thoughts on this topic. Um, we talk about these things in class from a very critical perspective, so it's just really nice to be able to uh, share this in a public forum. So um, Max Weber, he is a classical sociological theorist, and in his work, he spends a lot of time discussing um, the state and the government, and he basically says that the state is the human community that successfully, um, that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of violence within a given territory. 
And so in his work, he's essentially saying that this is how the state runs effectively and maintains power um, by violence, essentially. And so state violence is very common. And often the state is the primary culprit of violence against its civilian population. So it's nothing new. And I think a lot of times it, make us, it makes us squeamish. And I think so because it's just often uncomfortable for us to identify dysfunction in our own backyard. Um, so the idea that the state, um, that the police are agents in exercising excessive force on minority populations, particularly for minority populations, is not a far-fetched idea or even a work, um, reality. So I actually put these, um, these actually from the Pew Research Center, I actually put this up just to, um, just to kind of show these stark racial differences that exist in attitudes regarding um, state violence. And I have this here just to make the point that African Americans seem to be more privy to state violence because they are disproportionately the recipients of systematic and targeted violence. And so when I say um, police violence or police brutality, I'll use that interchangeably with state violence. Uh, I'm essentially talking about state violence because um, state violence is police uh, violence. Law enforcement is an extension of the state. And so it's really highlighted when we consider the, um, the increase of police um, mil militarization. And so um, police brutality is very common for uh, reality for many African Americans. I um, also want to quickly mention that death is rare in police violence. Well, I can't really say that because I can't really empirically uh, test that because we have no federal or national tracking system of police violence or misconduct regarding violence. The FBI and the BJS, they do um, track this, but the, uh, they do track incidents of deadly force, but it's up to the discretion of the sheriff's office or the departments, police departments, to provide the information. Um, but the point that I'm making is police uh, violence is, is just not just death, right? It, it, it's um, bribery, assault, battery, uh, inappropriate touching, rape, knees on neck, all those qualify as police violence or police brutality. In the media, we normally hear about the deaths, you know, with Rodney King being the exception. But uh, the point I'm making is it, it's a common reality for many African Americans. And, um, you know, it's now, now cell phone videos are now, um, you know, uh, have uh, videos of police violence up, it's on our local news. It's so much of a reality for America that the American Public Health Association, they declared a public health issue recently. And this acknowledgement is really huge because it identifies the state as being a major contributor to the poor health and quality of life for African Americans in a, in a roundabout way. And so I just want to note uh, really quickly, um, just individual racism versus institutional racism or slash state violence, because um, the opposing argument to police violence is that it's just uh, one bad apple. And so I like to say that the, the culture of racism in America is, is as American as apple pie, um, where Africans are seen as from the white gaze as you know, inferior to Europeans, uh, thus perceived as not deserving of full humanity. You know, this has and still is America's cultural racial ideology, whether overt or covert. And so culture just doesn't change itself overnight. And like Dr. Owen said, we all have been affected by this. Uh, we all have you know, typically grown up in this American culture, if you're from the US, um, where this you know, ideology is consistently and constantly reinforced. So we're all kind of messed up in that sense. Um, but when I reflect back on uh, the video of the George Floyd uh, murder, it was extremely eerie because um, Derek Chauvin, the, the officer who murdered him, he, to me, he did it so, it was so nonchalantly. It was just, it seemed to be so easy for him. And I think the reason why it may, my opinion, why it may seem um, so easy to commit acts of violence against, you know, black men, black women, and black children is due to the collective idea in this country that black lives don't matter, uh, right? So if they did, we wouldn't be in the street marching with posters that say black lives matter. So the driving force behind the acts by officers of the state are motivated by bias and racism. Uh, an officer thinking that um, and a, a person that he's arresting doesn't, doesn't deserve to live because he's unworthy or he's inferior. Uh, that type of thinking and prejudice uh, is a bad apple, right? Um, but the system behind the attitudes and beliefs, um, a system that almost seems to foster these ideas, um, encourage these behaviors, and protect these officers who commit these acts, that's institutional racism. That's state violence. And so I actually um, have up here um, this graph which shows the um, charges of police shootings and the ones that don't end up in convictions. And so just data from the mapping police violence uh, actually shows that since 2013, 99% uh, of officers were not charged in police killings. And of course, as you see here, of those who were charged, you know, convictions are extremely rare. 
So this is a system issue. <laughs> it's an institutional issue. It's a state issue. So I want to just talk briefly um, about this article, which was uh, published in 2016 after Trump won the election. Uh, the Washington Post published it, uh, How Trump Won the Revenge of Working Class Whites. And so like many uh, articles and political pundits after the, the election, uh, the narrative was that Trump was able to leverage uh, white working class resentment by inciting fears of labor competition and promising solutions, right? And so blue collar workers are often seen as, um, often, it's often used as a euphemism for uh, the white working class. And so the workforce, as we know, it has changed. You know, we have uh, technology, uh, computers, um, manufacturing jobs being shipped overseas, so it's changing. Uh, the general blue collar work, um, excluding these uh, skilled uh, craft positions, it's just not what it used to be. And a lot of Americans have felt and are feeling modern trends in, uh, in the labor market. And so there was a paper written, um, uh, Race States and Mixed Fate for White Men by UMass uh, researchers that examine national data and what the numbers show. And of course, we're, I'm, I'm coming from the understanding that historically the labor market has been historically male and historically white, you know, even positions that are now currently female dominated, right? So, um, but the, the article find that, uh, found that despite the increase in gender and racial diversity um, in educational and work environments, that white women and minorities of color did not pose uh, any competition to white educated men. Now, what they did find was that there is labor competition from minority men in states that have large minority populations. Um, also, with this same study, they surveyed these um, white working class um, folks and they found that these same white working class whites were also, um, they also expressed anti-elite, uh, anti-immigration, and racist ideas. And so I actually uh, have this up here because we do see that uh, whites are losing their share of uh, their income and wealth, and it's actually decreasing at a faster rate than their population share. So there are um, aspects of relative deprivation here, right? So in 1983, Sidney Herring, he was a law professor, NYU law professor, he wrote the book um, um, Policing a Class Society. And so in the book, he talks a lot about, a lot about state violence, um, about how the elite uh, divides the, the working class, uh, these repressive acts on the working class. And in Herring's book, he essentially argues that uh, working class whites look to the state to limit labor competition from minorities, especially since labor has historically been divided among racial lines. And so um, what he says is that um, politicians, they, they promote this, the, these law and order campaigns. Uh, and these law and order campaigns are essentially coded language uh, that basically uh, promises to crack down on immigration and urban crime, Latino men and black men, right? So uh, I'm a sociologist by training. And so in sociology, when we discuss culture, we have to think about how culture is created and how culture emerges. Um, so when we think of the culture of racism um, and definitely the police culture of excessive force on black and brown populations, we have to understand that cultures, culture stems from the political structure. And the political structure is rooted in the economy of the society, its mode of production. So um, I would actually argue that the motivation behind police violence of black and brown communities specifically is rooted in economics. And so um, the economics of the prison industrial system extends far beyond um, prisons uh, trying to market prison labor to corporations. Uh, in a capitalist system, labor is a commodity. Now, some would you know, argue that it's not, you know, but that's more so a philosophical question. But for this example, uh, we're gonna say that it is a commodity. Um, and so uh, there's a, a book written uh, called Glut uh, by a macroeconomist and banker, Daniel Alpert. And uh, the full title, title of the book is Glut, the US Economy and the American Worker in an Age of Oversupply. And in the book, uh, Albert, he basically says there's a there's an overabundance of labor and the private sector should come in and fix the problems, provide a solution. But what he says is that the private sector, it can't. So the state has to take responsibility. The state should fill in the gaps that the private sector is not able to fulfill. And so I would argue that the state actually has done that. And so how does the state deal with um, the oversupply in the market? They warehouse the excess labor. 
if there are a limited number of available jobs and a large pool of available candidates, there's a large proportion of people that's going to remain jobless. And we can review events over the last few months. Uh, we know that jobless people are just people who have time to sit around and think and ponder and talk and plan and organize. They can cause economic damage to businesses in cities. Uh, they can cause damage to the state. And so the state has warehoused excess labor and has built a whole system the prison industrial complex, a very profitable system. So state violence to me um, takes on a whole new meaning from this lens. Um, this is a really interesting perspective when you start to think about the transition from uh, indeterminate sentencing to determinate sentencing, which had uh, a lot of uh, negative effects. It actually resulted in longer sentences, uh, longer incarceration, increased convictions, particularly of those nonviolent crimes, especially drug offenses, and then also resulted in more strict post-release. So people began to violate uh, parole more, and that, of course, leads to more jail time um, and, and more fees. So this is a very deep, systematic um, human rights issue. And so uh, now I just want to briefly talk about the effects of state violence, uh, specifically mass incarceration on the black family, and then get into some, uh, into some solutions. So the first thing is that um, mass incarceration of black males results in increase in female-headed households. And this is an economic issue. Um, in 2017, 66% uh, of black households were female-headed. Um, and that's nearly 70 to 75, even 80% in some regional and local areas. So when we think about women and men, women um, compared to men are substantially more likely to be in poverty. Even when a woman is married and she divorces, that decreases her economic situation. The data shows this. So this brings up housing and food insecurity issues. Also, when men are incarcerated, you remove an earner from the household, right? Um, whether or not the man was living in the household or not, a man could be living, a man and woman could be living in two separate spaces, but he still can contribute financially to the cost of that child. So you essentially decrease the economic capital of that family. And this is a very important when you talk about black children you think about the poverty rate of black children black children are the um are the have the highest rate of poverty among all racial groups it's roughly 31 percent uh, nearly one in three black children live in poverty compare that to latinx and foreign born and um and native american children it's roughly a quarter of the population with whites and asians about 11 percent of their population so there's a great disparity there um, also, data from the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights, this is Van Jones Association, his organization, reports that 65% of families with an incarcerated member, they were unable to meet basic needs. And then also just being in the criminal justice system, being entangled in the criminal justice system is very costly. You think about the court costs, if you can afford an attorney, the attorney costs, the attorney fees, fines, um, just to make a phone call is expensive. So all these um, other incarcerated related fees can really add up and women end up taking on the burden of these costs. Um, the mom, the girlfriend, the wife, the sister, the cousin, the daughter, and these all negatively affect the economic situation of the family. But also to me, uh, as a person who's interested in, in maternal health, it brings up a, a host of women's health issues because think about the emotional, um, the emotional and the um, mental Total that this takes on women from having to carry on this financial responsibility. Uh, also, parental incarceration specifically leads to broken families and communities. When a parent, and I would even say when an uncle or aunt or a sister or older cousin is incarcerated, the family not only loses economic capital, but that family loses social and emotional capital. So having a loved one incarcerated can also bring on extreme grief, right? Um, children especially lose out on appropriate social, uh, socialization, which that's important for any community. And data show that having a parent incarcerated uh, leads to poor health among these children, um, or truancy, uh, and these kids end up, uh, tend, tend to go on to gather criminal offenses themselves. So it's just a, it's a cycle, a destructive cycle. Um, and so um, this can have just real social and emotional costs, it's very real. Uh, one in nine, although, um, the numbers on kids having parents in jail is increasing. Of course, the numbers are much higher for African Americans. One in nine black kids has had a parent in jail, right? Incarcerated. And so this phenomenon is so um, common that Sesame Street has actually had uh, episodes of um, 
that, that it actually address parental incarceration. And it's also worth noting that when mothers are in prison, their children tend to be separated or end up going into the foster system themselves. Um, the last thing that I want to discuss on the effects of state violence is that um, mass incarceration has resulted in reproductive issues. And so there are many Black women experiencing social infertility. Uh, social infertility is when a woman desires to conceive a child, but there, is no, there are no available comparable men to do so. And so what I'm saying is that state violence uh, via mass incarceration reduces the pool of comparable Black men for Black women. And this is especially, especially significant for Black people because Black people have very high rates of endogamy, which means that they marry within their culture, right? Um, and so um, not only that, but um, in, when a man is in prison, we've already established that he's not, a, he's not an economic asset, but because of his incarceration, he may lack education and or higher education, um, which decreases job opportunities. And even if he does have uh, education or degree, he still has the stigma of, uh, of incarceration being on him, especially if he has a felony conviction, which decreases job opportunities, as well as some educational opportunities. Um, and then even if a woman does find a man, um, there are, the woman has to consider or deal with the psycho-emotional trauma that comes from a man being incarcerated and the experiences that he may have uh, had in prison. And then the second thing is that the perceived, there's a perceived fear of raising a black child. So many reproductive justice advocates are now, or have been in the past, trying to make police violence actually a part of the framework of reproductive justice issues because of this. Uh, black children are actually perceived as dangerous. They're seen as older. They're seen as less innocent than white children. Um, black children are often policed. Um, and studies have, just, have shown that cultural um, and racial historical trauma can affect health and mental health. And so if you think about, uh, or, or more so the vi vicarious experiences of racism. So for example, a black parent seeing the video of Tamir Rice being murdered in the playground, um, that can adversely affect that black parent's mental and physical health, whether or not their child has a high risk of experiencing police violence or not. And then this stat up here I have from the Chicago Reporter um, just talks about just police violence on children in Chicago alone, one out of every 10 civil suits involve police misconduct towards a minor. So, um, and not only can that affect, like I said, going back to my curious experience of racism, can that affect the parent, but you have these videos that are being seen by children, and I'm sure a majority of adolescents, and so what effect is that having on black children? So black parents are forced to navigate uh, child rearing in a hostile and sometimes uh, violent environment. So I'm just going to touch on just really briefly and I'll come back um, once we discuss it and discuss my solutions um, in detail. But my first solution is number one is to get the research out there to inform target activism. Um, we have to make scholars have to make research available and put it out in different forms. Uh, we cannot rely on the oppressor to fix the problems of the oppressed. And so at Rhodes, I actually encourage ways for students to uh, showcase their work via infographics, a podcast, a web page creation. One of my students last semester actually created a web page looking at, um, at medical violence towards black women, particularly looking at Miriam Sims and that whole um, obstetrics, um, gynecological um, uh, stories about black women in the past and, and still today. And so we um, have to um, just get the research out there um, and share information with the public, which is why I'm so uh, glad that we have forums like this. Um, also, we need to track the appropriate measures. Uh, I mentioned that we don't uh, track um, uh, police violence. We need to start tracking that. Um, and then environmental racism is a really big issue for African Americans. Uh, it ha can affect fetal and child development. And it's not just a poor low-income African-American issue. It's a general African-American issue. Um, African-Americans are more likely to live, controlling for income and class, are more likely to live in polluted areas than whites. There's a disparity issue there, especially when you think about the um, environmental toxins and their associations with, um, like I said, child and fetal development, but also behavior problems. Um, and also, I am a proponent of reparations, so I do want to talk about that uh, as well and how that can uh, help to um, reduce um, state violence and not reduce, eliminate state, uh, state violence as well, and how that can actually uh, decrease the wealth disparities that we see, which is, I think, 
the, the root cause of many of these issues. And so this is a good stopping point and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Great. Uh, Dr. Lipford, thank you for making those connections. Um, I think it was it was very, very valuable to see those connections to uh, economics, to the Black family, to Black children, to maternal health. Um, I know in one of your slides, you had mentioned that um, the American Public Health Association had sort of made racism a public health issue, is that correct? And I wanna hear from you what, what sort of, um, you know, what do proclamations like that do? How do you see it helping? Um, yeah. I think it's very important that we, we declare it, but I also think it's important to put some action behind the words. Um, the American Public Health Association, they actually uh, declared it a public health issue um, a few years ago and they retracted mm -hmm. the statement, it was a political issue. And so I think that right now, this time it's trendy um, to say these things, but it's much more important to get a plan in place and follow the plan. Um, and so that, that's just kind of my concern uh, with this is that we, we have to have uh, definitive plans and we have to, to act. And so I would love to see um, you know, more work from the American Public Health Association as they try to you know, un unfold their plans. Definitely. Thank you, thank you. Um, I wanna pass it on to uh, Dr. Dwayne Loins, um, and then we'll open up the um, conversation for the audience to ask questions and for the panelists to ask questions of each other. Thank you, Dr. Marshawn. Um, first of all, good evening. And I'd like to begin by thanking uh, so many people who made this possible. First, I wanna thank all the panelists and moderators, including my co-panelists this evening, Drs. Owens and Dr. Lipford. Um, for contributing to this series and engaging a difficult yet important topic. I want to thank our amazing Office of Communications, uh, Matt and Dylan, we love you. I want to thank Dr. Kendra Holtz for helping to plan this series and especially thank Dr. Marshawn, our uh, moderator this evening, for conceiving of this idea and bringing it to fruition. And lastly, I want to thank some community partners that I've had the privilege of meeting with over the past several days, including MICA, the Memphis Interfaith Coalition for Action and Help, Hope, EAP, the Employee Assistant Professionals Association, and NFP, the Nurse Family Partnership. This series was planned in response to the global uprisings that have occurred in response to the tragic murders of Ahmaud Arbery in Glynn County, Georgia, Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and too many other countless names. But this evening, just for a few minutes, I'd like to begin elsewhere. And I want to begin in Aurora, Colorado, last year. Here are the basic facts of the case. Last August, 23-year-old Elijah McLean was walking home from the store. A resident placed a call to 911 reporting Mr. McLean's behavior. Police officers showed up and engaged Mr. McLean. The engagement is violent enough that Mr. McLean needs medical care. EMTs arrive. Mr. McLean has a heart attack on the way to the hospital, is declared brain dead, and dies three days later. I start with this tragic incident because it indicates the failure of law enforcement in particular and the criminal justice system in general at every level. First of all, there's a failure with community. If you listen to the four minute and nine second 911 call placed regarding Mr. McLean, the person who called in said that he looked quote sketchy and had his quote hands in the air. When the dispatcher asked if the, caller or if, any, if, if the caller or anyone else was in danger, the caller responded, no. So why are we calling the police on this black male when he's doing nothing wrong? Secondly, there was a failure by law enforcement officers. Why would they waste time and resources in responding to a call regarding someone walking down the street, minding their business, breaking no laws and harming no one? Furthermore, the officers show up tease Mr. McLean and place him in a carotid choke hole leading to his eventual demise. Let me pause here in case you're wondering. Aurora, Colorado police had already banned carotid choke holds except in cases where they were met with violent resistance and had exha exhausted all other options. Uh, Mr. McLean did not violently resist and they certainly had not exhausted all other options and yet they still engaged in a carotid choke hold and thirdly, this leads to the next failure. There's a departmental failure because in spite of that, these officers were cleared of any wrongdoing. Fourth, there's a legal failure. 
The district attorney refused to pursue the case because, to quote the DA, Mr. McLean's body did not have any injuries. In case you missed that, let me just say by way of reminder, Mr. McLean was perfectly healthy before the police showed up and is now dead, but the DA would not pursue the case because his body did not have any injuries. And lastly, there's something that I can't phrase any other way except to say there was a human failure. Several of the other officers of the Aurora P Police Department posed for a photo mocking the murder of Mr. McLean and justified it saying that they were, quote, trying to cheer up a friend by sending that photo. In light of this and so many other tragic questions, a common question that I get is this, what do we do? What can we do to ensure a better future with regard to law enforcement in Black communities? Put simply, how can we reimagine a better tomorrow? Well, to answer this question, this concern about the future, allow me to go back in the past. In fact, I need to go back several thousand years. In the Hebrew scriptures, what Christians call the Old Testament, there is an interesting concept in Leviticus chapter 25 called the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee means this, every 50 years, all debts are forgiven, indentured servants are released, ancestral lands are returned to their original owners. According to theologian Paul House, the principle, the justification for this is simple. People must honor the divine, honor God, honor Yahweh by refusing to take advantage of one another. Land and property ownership should not be based on social standing and human beings cannot be the permanent property of other human beings. Therefore, every 50 years, you have these things that happen. The logic is clear. Sometimes a nation becomes so sick Injustice becomes so rampant and systems become so toxic that the only way to heal is by a reset. Friends, we are 401 years into this experiment that we call America, and at no point in our nation's history have Black communities not been under siege by law enforcement organizations. Law enforcement organizations, from the first and formal one starting in Boston in 1636, to the first formal one starting in Boston in 1838 were birthed in slavery and continue that legacy of surveilling and brutalizing black bodies until today. What happened to George Floyd was terrible and his family deserves more justice than earthly courts can provide. But what happened to Mr. Floyd was in many ways routine. Therefore, in light of this, I'm going to make the case for just a few minutes that we need a Jubilee approach to solving our problems with police. That is, if we're going to heal the rift between black communities and law enforcement, we might need a reset. First, allow me to tackle the popular alternative to this more radical approach, namely the concept of piecemeal reform. There have been numerous ideas put forward lately, but the most popular set is something called the Eight Can't Wait, created by an organization called Campaign Zero. Ban chokeholds and strangleholds, require de-escalation, require warning before shooting, exhaust all alternatives before shooting, a duty to intervene when one officer sees another officer engaging in unnecessary force, ban shooting at moving vehicles, establish use of force continuum, and require all police to be reported. Let me begin by saying that none of these proposals in and of themselves are bad. But we have to take a step back, and here I'm thinking of my good friend, Dr. Ernest Gibson, and invoke James Baldwin and ask a question that I think Baldwin would ask. What kind of nation are we where we have to pass laws that tell police officers not to choke or strangle suspects? What's wrong with us that we have to implement a rule telling police to de-escalate a situation? But I digress. To the eight can't wait, we can add other common reforms that have been popular over time, body cameras, dash cams, diversifying police departments, community policing. The premise of all of these approaches is that systems of law enforcement are relatively stable and just, and what is needed are tweaks and fixes in the form of rules and policies that allow law enforcement to continue largely unabated. Allow me to present a few challenges to a reform-only approach. The first set of challenges are ideological. Reform policies tend to be too police-centered. Police departments are not just a problem. They're, often, they're also symptoms of a broader society that struggles with race and violence. Reform approaches say that we're going to fix law enforcement merely by implementing policies about police practices. Secondly, 
reform approaches radically misunderstand the history of policing, especially with regard to black communities. Law enforcement exists to violently manage and maintain social inequities, and you can't reform or fix something that is intrinsically damaged. Second, there's a historical or practical problem with reform only approaches. Black communities and others have been asking for significant police reform for decades with no substantive improvement. In 1968, the Kerner Commission was convened by President Lyndon Johnson to respond to uprisings in urban communities in 1967. The commission did an exhaustive study and said that there are two drivers of violence and crime in urban areas, poverty and institutional racism. They recommended, therefore, that the government, and tell me if this sounds familiar, needs to not invest in law enforcement, but invest in social programs that deal with crime at the root instead of after the fact. We asked for these reforms in the 1960s. Reforms were demanded after the 1992 LA riots, after Ferguson in 2014, after Baltimore in 2015. We had this problem in Memphis last summer in the Fraser community in 2019. And now we are still asking for the same reforms that have not led to substantive change. Furthermore, these reforms do not work. Look at the Minneapolis Police Department, which is held up as a model of progressive police reform. The department offers procedural justice as well as trainings for implicit bias, mindfulness and de-escalation. It embraces community policing and officer diversity, bans warrior style policing, uses body cameras, implemented an early intervention system to identify problematic officers, receives training around mental health crisis intervention, and practices reconcili reconciliation efforts in communities of color. And yet, George Floyd was still murdered. San Francisco Police Department. As I recall, as I mentioned earlier, the organization that created the eight can't wait is Campaign Zero. San Francisco has implemented all eight of the eight can't wait reform policies that Campaign Zero has suggested. And yet Campaign Zero, the same group that came up with the eight can't wait, gave San Francisco's police department an F rating in their police scorecard. The Chicago Police Department has six of the eight can't wait policy reforms, and yet the Justice Department, after a sustained 13-month investigation, found that the Chicago Police Department regularly uses excessive force and treats people as animals or subhuman. Lastly, even with reforms, police unions are extremely powerful and have effectively been able to get disciplinary sanctions reduced or dismissed. The two individuals before you are Timothy Russell and Malaysia Williams. One day they were in their car in East Cleveland, Ohio. An officer saw them, ran their plates, their plates came back clean. He wanted to pull them over anyway on the pretext of some sort of driving violation. He chased them, several cars followed. They heard the car backfire. They of course thought it was a gun. They were unarmed. Finally, they came to a stop in the middle of a parking, a middle school parking lot. Officers again claimed they saw a gun and shot these two individuals 137 times, including an officer named Michael Brillo who jumped on the hood of the car and fired into the car around 24, 23 times. No officer served jail time for this, even though they were fired. I mention this only because despite the excessive inhumanity of what occurred, the police union in Cleveland still defended all of these officers and is to this day trying to get them reinstated and thinks the fact that they were fired is ridiculous. So if reforms haven't worked, if they reflect a significant understanding of the problem, what then is the way forward? And I wanna make a case for the radical, but actually not so radical idea that we've been hearing about, namely defunding the police or abolishing police. These are technically two distinct positions, but I think they're close enough for the purposes of this conversation. One resource for defunding and abolishing police is something called eight to abolition. Defund police, demilitarize communities, remove police from schools, free people from prisons and jails, repeal laws criminalizing survival, invest in community self-governance, provide, provide safe housing for everyone and invest in care, not cops. Another one focused on more of a legislative approach is the BREATHE Act put forward by the Movement for Black Lives. I'd recommend that you look up both of these resources for more information. We'll only be able to skim the surface in our time remaining. 
what are some of the uniting features of this, 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 this approach, the defund abolition approach? They start again with the sad reality that policing in the United States exists not to protect and serve black communities, but to violently manage and maintain social inequities. That's a strong statement, but I believe it's one that's borne out by historical data. There's a myth when people hear about defunding and abolition. At some point in the future, if we defund or abolish the police, there will be no one to call in a crisis. No. We need to reimagine the scope of law enforcement. Defunding, abolishing the police does not mean and never has meant that in a time of crisis, there's no one to call. And in fact, we already do this. When you call 911 to report that your house is on fire, you expect a fire truck to show up, not a police squad car. If your child has an allergic reaction to something and is having trouble breathing, you expect an EMT to show up and not a police squad car. We rely on police officers for too many tasks that are probably better handled by specially trained individuals. And lastly, we need to reimagine public safety. We've heard too many times the adage that if the only tool you have is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. For too long, the only item in our toolbox has been violence through policing and incarceration. What sense does it make to criminalize and punish homelessness, to criminalize and punish addiction, to criminalize and punish poverty? Part of the problem is that we are so beholden to the way we do things that we can't imagine what public safety would look like apart from this heavy hand of justice. And for that, I'm grateful to Amber Houston, who's created a series of posters that help us in that effort. A few examples. A few years ago, four years this month, in a suburb of Minneapolis, Philando Castile was pulled over because of allegedly a poor uh, failing brake light. I should mention at this point that at this time, Philando Castile had been pulled over at least 46 times by police officers and had fined somewhere around $6,000. The officer being informed that Mr. Castile was a card-carrying uh, card carrying gun owner and had a gun in the car, immediately got nervous and shot him seven times in front of his girlfriend and their four-year-old daughter in the back of the car. But let's reimagine public safety. You don't know it, but your brake lights aren't working. So imagine, imagine a world where a city employee signals for you to pull over and says, hey, how about I replace those lights for you right here so no one gets hurt? An hour later, both lights work and you're at home. Isn't that public safety? A few years ago in Dallas, a gentleman named Tony Tempa called the police on himself saying that he was having a mental health crisis. Police showed up, mocked him, teased him, put him in a prone position similar to Mr. Floyd. And when the EMT showed up, they put his body in the ambulance. And on video, we have dash cam footage of this. The paramedic throws his gloves down in disgust and says he's dead because these officers had killed him, even though he had called the cops asking for help because of a mental health crisis. You're experiencing a mental health crisis and you're afraid. Imagine a world where you call 311 and a first responder trained in mental health comes to your door. One hour later, you're in a safe place with your consent, with plans for follow-up care. Isn't that public safety? Lastly, in my former home of Milwaukee in 2014, Dontre Hamilton, a 31-year-old 31, 31 sleeping in the park who was struggling with schizophrenia, was approached by a police officer who demanded that he stand up and began searching him. Mr. Hamilton was unarmed, but a struggle ensued, and a police officer shot him 14 times, killing him. Some folks are sleeping on benches in the park. Imagine a world where a city employee comes by and checks in to see if they need a place to sleep, food, water, or health care. An hour later, those who want a different place to sleep have one. Isn't that public safety? Lastly, the important thing to remember is that defunding abolition focuses not on what is being taken away, but about what we need to create. And with that, I'll close with this wonderful quote from Ruth William, William, Wilson Gilmore, who is one of the main leaders in this fight for abolition. Abolition is about presence, not absence. It's about building life-affirming institutions. It's about preventing crime by establishing a society where we have healthy families, where we practice transformative and reparative justice, where there are strong safety nets when you fail and when you mess up, where people are employed, healthy, and educated. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Loins. That was very, very insightful and, you know, introduced me to things I had never thought of or considered. I really appreciate, you know, the ideological and historical and practical issues with reform. And I think that that was very insightful for many of us watching. Um, I do have a question and I want to invite Dr. Owens and Dr. Lipford back um, because I think this can start a really rich conversation amongst the three of you all. So Dr. Loins, you, um, you introduced us to some alternatives, right? Um, what is public safety? And for me, I think that that's the coordination of a lot of these differing services, right? So with Dr. Owens and the mental health perspective and you know, Dr. Lipford and the many perspectives that you brought from um, both incarceration, economics and the black family, um, I wanna hear from you all about how do we um, best coordinate these efforts um, if abolition and defunding is truly the path um, to more equitable sort of communities? I can begin and just answer briefly because I know our time is short. Um, this is one of the problems with the reform approach, as I mentioned, because reform focuses too narrowly. Um, what people who talk about defunding the police and abolition are thinking about is we need to change society. Remember, it's not just police officers and departments that are violent against Black bodies. As a society, we are violent against Black bodies. Um, one of the uh, ideas, theoretical frameworks that I appeal to often is Afro-pessimism based upon a work by Orlando Patterson called Slavery and Social Death. And one of the things Mr. Patterson talks about is this idea that Black bodies are open to gratuitous violence, meaning not just law enforcement, but in the deep underbelly of our national consciousness, we believe that African Americans are deserving, deserving of violence. So we just can't change law enforcement. We have to change um, every aspect of society. And so that's why defunding and abolition approaches say we do have to coordinate all of these groups in one sustained effort to not just call law enforcement every time there's a problem, but we have to have this coordinated attempt to, um, you know, serve every aspect of society in this way. Yeah, I will also add to that. I think we also need to not focus just also just on the violence part, but I think we also view black bodies as a commodity in this uh, society as well. So as a nation, I think it's really important to um, re-examine the way that we commodify the black, examine how we commodify the black body and a plan in place to restructure our economy so it's not a social system that's built on exploitation. Um, when I was actually on the city council call when they were discussing and voting on uh, defunding the police, uh, the, the, the proposal that Tammy Sawyer brought up, and the only thing that everyone seemed to be concerned about was how they're going to make payroll, and that's it. So, um, you know, we, we commodify black bodies, and we really need to look at that as a society and, and work on a, a different economic system. Yeah, and I would just add to that, um, you know, that we we also have to see ourselves, you know, as a Black community, we have to see ourselves as, as human and as having worth and having value and having, um, you know, uh, just a lot to contribute to uh, society as well, because we can work, I, I believe, and we have to work on the systems and the institutions and all of that. Um, and until we, you know, also uh, recognize the value of our black bodies because we've been taught, you know, not to uh, respect and, and, and love our black bodies, our minds, our spirits, you know, until we're able to do that for ourselves as well, you know, in addition to all the external changes, um, you know, we're, uh, we're only attending to part of the issue. So I just wanted to share that. Definitely. Thank you for that. We have a question from the audience. So um, I think another thing that we're trained or that we automatically associate is that police protect us from violence. But uh, the fact in the United States is that we have an overabundance and um, many people rely and use guns for sport and for protection. So how do we get communities to feel safe um, when there is this overabundance of guns in, in our nation? I can start and answer that. Um, you're right. We have 320 million, 27 million U.S. citizens, 393 million guns. For every 100 citizens, there are 120 guns. And so when I talk about demilitarizing law enforcement, which certainly we have to do, um, one of the things I get, one of the items of pushback that I get is, 
Um, why would we want to demilitarize police? Because their assumption, part of it is the warrior militaristic training, but also their assumption is that the person they encounter who they pull over may very well likely have a gun. We are the only nation in the world where we have more guns than people. So when I talk to my colleagues in other countries, including a dear friend of mine who in Britain is doing some similar work to mine, um, she says the conversation is different because law enforcement officers, first of all, they're not worried about everyone having a gun because no one has a gun in, in Britain. Uh, and in fact, law enforcement officers in Britain don't carry guns. If you need a law enforcement officer with a gun, you have to call a special team and they bring a gun to the scene. So um, obviously part of this, you know, means that we have to um, in addition to all of these things, and that's why it's a holistic approach, we also have to have a serious law about conversation about gun control and what that means, especially in urban communities. Yeah, definitely. So um, a saying that I think many in the Black community have heard is, you know, you have to work twice as hard, twice as hard to get half as far. Um, so we have a, a medical student, a Black medical student in the chat who asked, you know, um, how, how do you survive in a space that wasn't meant for you? Dr. Owens, you mentioned this a lot. So how, how does one, you know, handle this racial trauma that we see on a day-to-day -day basis? It's perpetuated in the curriculum. Um, we face it from professors, from administrators, for those of, um, you know, our supervisors, those that we have to report to. So how does one find ways to overcome these injustices and still succeed and stay sane? <laughs> Uh, you know, I will say I'm still working through that myself. So, um, you know, I'm in process and, and welcome you to be in process too. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think some of this is about choice, you know, figuring out what do you have capacity for in the space that you're in. Uh, because sometimes we're walking to those white spaces and we, we don't have the capacity, the mental and the emotional uh, wherewithal to to fight everything and to say something to every you know microaggression or racial abuse that happens um, and sometimes we do uh, and sometimes we do because we've taken care of ourselves outside of those white spaces so we we've been with um, our black community we've been with our black families like we've you know we've done our own mental and emotional work to be able to to be in that space and then be able to, to challenge and to fight uh, what we need to in those white spaces. And so, you know, if you do have capacity being able to speak and say, you know, exactly what happened, you know, bear witness and give voice to what's happening for you and to you. Um, and also, you know, if the, if the system can protect you as far as HR, as far as, you know, different entities like that, uh, this is a time, you know, a lot of companies, a lot of institutions are real sensitive to racial issues right now. Um, so I would say that um, if anything is happening for you uh, to to make sure and say something, if, if that's what you choose to do. Um, and it's always so important to have support outside of that, that white space. So whoever that is for you, whoever the people that pour into you and give to you and don't deplete you, those are the people you need to be talking to you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Just briefly, you know, Dr. Owens made a statement that really resonated with me in her presentation. She said, um, you have survived something you weren't meant to. And so just on a personal note, uh, for me, I would say just uh, hope and spirituality, uh, just making sure that I find my place of peace, because I do know that I come from a, a mighty people who has survived a really great thing and who's still surviving things. So just know that you, know, you are a survivor and just you know, continue to push. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, in our first panel, um, the Malcolm X quote on progress, which says, if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, there's no progress. If you pull it all the way out, that's not progress. Progress is healing the wound that the blow made. And they haven't even pulled the knife out, much less healed the wound. Um, they won't even admit that the knife is there. So, um, you know, we talked about intergenerational trauma, um, intergenerational wealth that creates this racial wealth gap. So there's so much to heal from. And I know Dr. Lipford, you mentioned reparations a bit, but I wanna hear from each of you and your perspectives, how do we first heal the wound? I mean, and going back to Malcolm X, like first we need to identify that this is a systemic 
institutionalized system and that's creating sort of the issues that we're facing in society. So one, that's the recognition. Two, heal the wound. And then three, think about the future. So from your different perspectives, how do we um, even envision this? How do you envision this? I personally think the first step is reparations. Uh, that's the very first step. Uh, reparations is to repair what has been done wrong. And so African Americans or Africans have been done wrong. Um, and so that's the very first step. Uh, we look at the data on the polls on reparations or more so attitudes regarding reparations. There are, um, the, the, you know, the support of whites is very, very low. And to me, that is an indicator to me that um, that white America is not ready to fully heal. Because like I said, th to me, that will be the first step. And so, um, yeah, I think I'll digress there and let others speak. And so uh, just really quickly, in reparations will be looking towards the future. That way, there have been many proposals on, on how that would look. Um, Bob Johnson has just recently um, uh, proposed that there be direct payments. Uh, there's been a professor, uh, I think his name, uh, Theodore Johnson, who has proposed that African American votes be counted as five thirds, since we were at one point counted as three fifths. There have been proposals to not have African Americans pay taxes. Uh, just recently, I forget the town in North Carolina, there was a, a, a proposal or that actually passed it uh, that actually granted reparations for uh, the black residents in there uh, in the form of asset building institutions in that community. So it's, I think it's very possible um, if we rally and organize, I think that it is, that it is very probable. Um, and I look forward to seeing where, where that goes, but, but to me, that is the very first step. Admitting wrongdoing via form of, uh, reparations. If I could follow up on that, um, when Dr. Lipford talks about, rightly talks about reparations, I know some people in the audience may think, well, that's just crazy. All those ideas are too fantastical. Um, I just want to remind us that uh, throughout our history, we've done plenty of reparations. We just don't like reparations for Black people. And we actually gave reparations to people who own slaves. So I just want us to remember that as we think about how radical this idea is, we've done reparations before. We just are selective in how we like to do it. But to answer Dr. Marshawn's question, um, back in March with the... Um, coming on of the COVID-19 pandemic, the world kind of changed and we all buckled down and, and um, we kind of did all these things. And now we're kind of having this resurgence, but scientists are telling us that it's not that we are in a second wave of the uh, pandemic. We actually haven't completed the first wave of the pandemic, unfortunately. When I think about what we need to do, um, what brings me a little bit of despair is the fact that we haven't even done the first step of what it would take to uh, re-envision and reimagine society for a better tomorrow. I shared with a group earlier today that uh, I'm, I'm a Christian. I go to church every Sunday, and at the end of most Protestant churches, um, there's something called a gospel presentation. And when a person does a gospel presentation, the pre preacher up front, uh, they say the first thing is you have to repent. And I would say the first step is that we have to repent. Repent means a few things. It comes from a Greek word, metanoia, which means to turn around. So it means to and go the opposite direction. So it does mean we have to lament what's happened. My heart breaks for all of the families who had engagements back then and even now with law enforcement officers that ended violently, but they didn't have a camera to record it. And therefore the official report said, you know, the person pulled out a gun on the officer or engaged violently when perhaps that was not the case, as we saw in the shooting of Walter Scott, where he was shot in the back for no other reason than the officer was too lazy to chase after someone who was running slowly in the grass. So we first have to repent and lament, but then also we have to say we have to hold people accountable. Right now in law enforcement departments all around the United States are people who have engaged in heinous actions. And if we are serious about justice, we have to hold them accountable. And then we can talk about what we're going to do tomorrow once we've settled the debts of the past. We see a slight example of this in South Africa in the 1990s when apartheid came to a formal end. Um, I was in South Africa a year ago, two years ago, and it's still informally there. And they had the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions where they said, if you agree, all of you people who killed and, and worked tirelessly against apartheid, if you agree to share what you've done, then we will be willing to hear you and you won't suffer any um, punishment for it. Now, I'm not an advocate of letting people confess things and get off scot-free, but we do need some sort of 
judgment, some sort of national discussion where we talk about what's been done in the past and we hold individuals accountable. So to answer your question, I think we need to repent. That includes lament and just feeling terrible about what's happened, but also being uh, determined to hold people accountable for it. And just really quickly with that being held accountable, I want to say that I think we, all, we should also um, record police misconduct. You can't improve something if you don't measure it. And so studies have shown that when it's actually been recorded, that uh, police, violence, police violence has actually decreased. So that is a very important point. Yeah, and I would just share, I think, uh, in part, my kind of first thing is, is to name it, you know, name, name what's happening. Um, every time, <laughs> uh, become the squeaky wheel, become the, the person or the, the leader of the community that, that does not allow for um, a blind eye to be um, set on what's going on. And I think that's exactly what, you know, Drs. Lawrence and Lipford are saying, you know, uh, it just in, in various ways. Um, but I do think uh, we also have to, to key in to the fact that we are game changers and that we have power. And often we don't know it because we, we don't see that, you know, um, reflected back to us by society. Um, and so sometimes we learn helplessness, we learn powerlessness, we learn silence and suppression of our own selves and our own minds and narratives, because that's been what we've, what's been reinforced. And so sometimes that what is really helpful in healing is to, to name it, to say it, to exercise power, um, whether that's at a systemic level, you know, as far as voting, as far as protesting, as far as uh, moving uh, through white spaces, um, but also that happens, you know, at the individual level as well. Uh, again, you know, there's so much healing in, in calling forth and, and saying uh, what has happened with you. Uh, that is the power of lament. That is the power um, of confession as well, you know, not just for our white counterparts, but also for ourselves, you know. Um, and I just think the other part, you know, uh, of course, in relation to all the wonderful things that were already said, is just the fact that we have to do a deep and reckless inventory um, and excavation of our learned white supremacy. Um, and we, we must figure out and, and do the work of knowing, like, how do we uh, move every day uh, in, in uh, the worship of whiteness and in the worship of white supremacy? How do we do that? You know, when we walk into schools, when we walk into our jobs, when we even interact with people who look like us, how often are we demonizing dark skin and, and prioritizing lighter skin? All of the ways that it kind of moves. For, um, for our community. And so that is not easy work um, and it's not necessarily systemic, but I do think it's like that, that meeting um, of uh, the, the individual, uh, the, the personal and the political, you know, of making sure that we're um, uh, engaging the work that's gonna bring healing and, and wellness um, from, from all places. So that's what I would say would be helpful. Yeah, I appreciate all of your responses. It, it is it is difficult work, right? It's hard. It's like you said earlier, potentially re-traumatizing, but making those connections, naming it. I think um, you all are very, very, you know, on point when those are the recommendations that you are making. So I want to open it up to you all if you have any last minute things. We're um, running out of time, but if there's something that you wanted to say that you haven't said, I want to give you all that moment. Any lasting, you know, last thoughts that you want the audience to take home? I'll just say this. Um, all of the ideas that we put forward seem hard. Um, in reality, they're not hard. We've, we've done harder things. Um, getting rid of slavery was hard. That was difficult. Um, people actually believe that it was their God-given right to own other human beings, and yet we, we abolished slavery, and now we thank the people who did that. Um, I was thinking the other day that getting human beings to the moon was terribly difficult. Um, but when John F. Kennedy said it, uh, put the challenge before us, he said, we do these things not because they're easy, but because they are hard. It is hard to get someone to the moon, land, land a ship, have them walk around, get back on that ship and come back to earth and land safely. That is terribly difficult and yet we pulled that off. So um, this is not too hard for us to do. The question is, do we have the honesty and the political will to actually do it? Um, besides that, thank you all for a wonderful panel and it was great to be a part of this.
Dr. Lipford, Dr. Owens, any last gems you want us to take forward with us? <laughs> On top of all the ones you've already shared. <laughs> Um, I do want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, this is hard work, but we do hard things and um, the, the world, the future world will thank us all for doing the work now. Um, so I want to thank Dr. Loins, Dr. Lipford, Dr. Owens one more time. I want to thank you all for tuning in this evening. Um, this is the last panel um, of this series and I hope that you've learned a lot, thought about it, pondered it. Um, continue to think about these connections. Um, although this is our last panel, I encourage you to continue to engage with these ideas. Um, these uh, panels are recorded and